So let's let's dive deep into HTTP2 with Edgar Mikelian from Curator Labs. Get your questions ready. Hi everyone. Before starting, I want to thank the organizers to the opportunity to speak at the High Load Conference again. It's always a pleasure for me. Uh, let me introduce my, myself. Uh, my name is Edgar. I am a technical team lead at uh, Curator Labs. My team and I work closely with customers to provide deep technical expertise and achieve in designing appropriate uh, protection strategies against the DOS attacks and other challenges that can lead to service and availability on the internet. Okay, today's conversation is about HTTP2 or H2 for short. It's the second major revision of the hypertext transfer protocol, which improves the performance of the web and designs to provide a better experience, considering the rapid technological development of the internet in past 10, 20 years. A uh, very single agenda. Introduction, a uh, bit about uh, the history of the protocol. There we will speak about HTTP 1 limitations that lead to the new version. Then we will see what good we have in HTTP 2 and gradually move on to shortcomings and vulnerabilities. And of course, my favorite part of uh, Q&A. Understanding the challenges and vulnerabilities uh, of HTTP2 is crucial for effective security and mitigation strategies. It helps to identify potential attack vectors, implement appropriate protection, and ensure the resilience of systems and applications using HTTP2. Okay, so now we're going to back to a little bit uh, of the history of the HTTP protocol. Invented by Tim Berners-Lee in early 19s, HTTP is the underlying communication protocol of the World Wide Web. Initial version of HTTP 0.9, a simple request and response protocol, very telnet friendly. We can do one GET request and receive one hypertext only response, after which the TCP immediately closed the connection. No HTTP headers, no status error codes, no URLs request, and, uh, and then HTTP 1.0, uh, more uh, browser-friendly protocol. It provides header fields, including extended uh, metadata about both request and response. Not limited to hypertext only, content type uh, header provides the ability to transmit files other than uh, Plain HTML files, maybe scripts, some style sheets, uh, any media files. And finally, in 1997, HTTP 1.1 standardized. It's the first fully standardized uh, version of the protocol, uh, which were a protocol uh, that introduced uh, critical uh, performance uh, optimizations and future enhance enhancements such as uh, persistent connections, chunk transfers, compression, content negotiation. Uh, as I already said, the web has changed a lot of since 1997 and demands much, much more from HTTP. We don't have only resource-rich websites uh, with thousands or millions of uh, requests, but also have much faster internet than we had in 90s. As user now expects faster web page load, better security of the data that they transmit, and good web browsing experience even when on poor networks. Uh, most of the problems listed on the, this slide uh, boil down to slow communication or a slower internet surfing due to HTTP 1 is implemented. I'm sure you all know workarounds how to improve HTTP 1 performance, such as domain sharding, uh, spriting, etc. Let's dig deeper and try to understand how HTTP, uh, understand how and why HTTP 1 is inefficient in handling today's requirements. As you already know, HTTP is a request and response protocol. So browser uh, make a request, 
the server process the request and give you a response. It looks like it looks like this amazing animation. However, does that work? First of all, all of this goes through TCP connection. So client, client browser must be establish a TCP connection to the server. It's a stateful three-way handshake. And also, if needed, additional SSL handshake. After then, you, uh, you make one request through that TCP uh, connection, for example, to get uh, index HTML. And guess what? The pipe, the TCP connection is busy. It's used. You can send another request as long as your current request is being processed. This adds a lot of penalties every time and slow down the rendering of the web page. OK, what will uh, happen if I need to be sent multiple requests? For example, also need to be some script JS, style CSS, image GPG. Browser have a hack. Browser can establish up to six uh, TCP connection. And OK, if uh, when one is busy, it can use another one. And that seems to be solved problem. Yeah, let's look at the next slide. Statistics for the last three years from HTTP archive shows that on average about 70 requests are needed to get one site. And if, if you look at the 95th percentile, more than 170. This leads to very slow loading of sites since uh, all other requests after the first six have to wait until others uh, will be processed. And most importantly, if some other heavy requests take too long to execute, we get, get situation called head of line blocking. The HTTP header of the head of line request blocks the subsequent ones to be to on a single TCP connect, connection. A simple analogy is uh, platforms on a railway station. If the platforms are occupied by trains, all the trains that are behind are blocked until these trains depart. A good solution would be the ability to multiple, multiplex request in one TCP connections. Since for one request, TCP connection remains as very, very unutilized. But we can. Let's see why it's not possible in HTTP 1. In this case, we are sending style CSS after the response for uh, script.js has been transmitted. The headers and the content for style CSS are simply appended after the JavaScript file. The receiver uses the content length header to know where each response ends and another starts. In our simplified scheme example, script.js is 1,000 1, bytes large, while style CSS is just 600 bytes. All of that seems sensible and know in this simple example with two small files. However, imagine a scenario in which the JavaScript file is much larger than CSS. Say, one megabyte instead of one kilobyte. In this case, the CSS would have to wait before the entire JS file is, uh, was downloaded, even though it's much smaller and so could be parsed uh, used earlier. The real solution to this problem would be to employ multiplexing. If we can cut up each file's payload into smaller pieces or chunks, we can mix or interleave them, those chunks on the wire. The main problem here is the HTTP1 is a purely textual protocol that only appends headers to the front of the payload. It does nothing further to uh, differentiate individual chunks or of resources from one uh, another. Let's illustrate this uh, with an example of what would happen if we tried it anyway. The browser starts parsing the headers for JavaScript and the accepts 1,000 bytes of payload to follow. It, however, only receives uh, 500 JavaScript bytes, the first chunk, first TCP packet, and then starts reading the headers for style CSS. It interpreting the CSS headers and the first CSS chunk as a part of the JavaScript. 
and the payload and headers for both files are just plain text, and it stops after reading 1,000 bytes, ending up somewhere halfway through the second JavaScript chunk. At this point, it doesn't see valid new headers and has to drop the rest of third TCP packet. The browser then passes what it thinks the script.js to the JavaScript parser, uh, which fails because it's not well JavaScript. As this problem can be solved with HTTP 1, and the patchwork solution of parallel TCP connections didn't scale to well over time, it was clear that totally a new approach was needed, which became uh, HTTP 2. OK, HTTP 2 is the second major version of HTTP protocol, uh, spe specifically designed to reduce latency, optimize network utilization, and enhance the overall browsing experience for users. It builds upon the foundation of its predecessor, HTTP 1, but introduces several key features and improvements. By introducing uh, multiplexing, HTTP 2 allows multiple requests to be sent simultaneously over a single connection, reducing the overhead and improving efficiency. Additionally, HTTP 2 incorporates header compression to reduce the size of requests and the response headers, resulting in more efficient bandwidth usage. These advancements, along with other kinds of optimization like server push and prioritization of requests, contribute to a smoother and more responsive browsing experience for user, users across the web. Uh, let's take a closer look at each other of them. Multiplexing. In HTTP 2, the browser opens one big, super fast TCP connection and can send all requests through that. Server can process those requests and uh, respond to them on the same TCP connection. How did it become possible? HTTP 2 allows multiple requests to be in progress at the same time or a single connection using different streams for each HTTP request or response. A new concept, stream, is added. Stream is a bidirectional flow of bytes within an established connection, which may carry one or more messages and have its own ID. The new framing layer in HTTP 2 removes the limitation of the previous versions and enables full request and response multiplexing. It achieves this by allowing the client and server to break down an HTTP messages into independent frames, interleave them, and then reassemble them on the other end. The frame is the smallest unit of communication in HTTP 2, each containing a frame header that, at minimum, identifies the streams to which the first belongs. Similarly, responses can be sent back in any order. We, can, we have a stream ID that allows us to reassemble requests regardless of their order in uh, received. So if a uh, heavy request is longer to process, it doesn't delay the arrival of other responses. This solves the HTTP head of line blocking problem. It's also important to understand that the requests are not sent at exactly the same time, since each frame needs to be sent after another on the same HTTP TCP connection. There is only one network connection, so each request would be queued to be sent at the network level. The main point is that the HTTP connection is not blocked after sending a request until the response is received, as it was in HTTP 1. Uh, the second good news is that HTTP 2 is binary, packet-based protocol, whereas HTTP 1 is entirely text-based. Text-based protocols are easy to humans for understand, but more difficult to computers for, uh, to parse it. This situation was acceptable for the simple request and the response uh, protocol that uh, HTTP start, uh, start out as but is increasingly limiting the use of the protocol for the modern internet. The binary representation of HTTP 2 is for the sending and the receiving of messages divided into frames. A frame consists of length of frame, type, some configuration flags, a reserved bit, 
stream identifier and frame payload. But the messages themselves are similar to older HTTP 1 messages. Uh, the semantics are same. It is the same methods, get, post, put, so on. It's the same URLs, so same schemes, same status codes. The next good news is uh, header compression. Now we know that HTTP2 is completely, completely binary, and we get a good opportunity to use compression not only for the request body, but also for headers that can reach impressive sizes due to large cookies and a large number of custom headers, which can be a several dozens in one request. Obviously, when there are a lot of requests, the redundant header fields in these requests unnecessarily consume bandwidth, significantly increasing the delay. To compress headers, a special HPAC algorithm uh, was developed, which is described in separate RFC 7541. HPAC keeps a table of the headers on the client and servers. Then when the second and some subsequent headers are sent across the just reference, the header number on the header table. For do this, it used two different uh, tables. Static dictionary, a uh, predefined dictionary of commonly used header fields, some with predefined values, and dynamic dictionary, a, li a list of actual headers that were encountered during the connection. How effective it is can be seen in the next slide. This is especially effective for incoming requests where there are mostly headers with a small request body or nobody at all. We can see that the total ingress traffic is reduced by 53% at the result of HPAC compression. Obviously, that we significantly save bandwidth and uh, reduce latency. And let's move on to the last good, or not so good, HTTP2 future, and look at another beautiful animation on this slide. In this case, when the client makes a request to get, for example, index HTML, the server knows that it also will need style CSS, script.js, and some image GPG to display the page. It means that the server can proactively send resources to the client. The server tries to prepopulate the browser's cache with the resources so that when the resources are needed, it is already available to, uh, and doesn't need to be requested saving a time. On the one hand, this is very good, but in real practice, we encounter difficulties in implementation and all data in a browser cache. And because of this, the technology, technology wasn't widely used. Chrome is going to drop support for it soon, which is shocking because it would be a violation of specification, but it's, it's Google, it's okay, right? Okay, everything uh, seems so great that you will think to quit everything and start migrating all applications to HTTP2 as soon as possible. The new version of the protocol will save us from the need to constantly tune HTTP1 to speed up the web page. But there is a big, one big bet that minimizes the, all the benefits of HTTP2 and why? Uh, this is what we are discussing up to this point. We were talking about the client, we were talking about the server and what, uh, uh, what client connects to the server. But this is possible only in the beautiful dreams of the system administrator. In real life, the architecture is a lit, little bit like uh, this one. At a minimum, we have uh, some kind of front-end, which is an HTTP reverse proxy, maybe a web application firewall or a load balancer. Such devices usually terminate a HTTP session on themselves, do an SSL offload, possibly also analyze the traffic and then connect it with the backend server and proxy the initial uh, client requests to it. Uh, but un unfortunately, the real world like this. Those boxes between the client and the server are not necessarily the ones in, under your control. For you, they are black boxes. They can be cloud load balancers, 
some web application firewalls. In our filtration network, we have hundreds of uh, such boxes that analyze and filter traffic from DDoS attacks and uh, parser bots. All CDM providers also consist of such boxes. Many of them develop their own web servers and balancers for themselves. There are some that take, for example, the well-known NGX as, as a basis. You don't have the client connected directly to the server. You have the client connected with only with the first proxy in the way. And then, now, please don't be disappointed. All other boxes on the traffic path after the first stop don't support HTTP2 in upstream. They are forced to downgrade to HTTP1, and all of this minimize, minimizes all the benefits of HTTP2. Once back in early 2010s, when the cloud services were just beginning to our revolution, the developers of the web servers assumed that the front-end proxy and back-end server within the same data center, and there was a very high-speed connections between them didn't need to support HTTP2 and no HTTP1 with a large number of uh, persistent TCP connections. But as the time has shown, they were wrong, and now I think such support looks like a very complicated and long process. It's even unrealistic, given the very large number of different vendors and uh, legacy boxes Migration will take more than a decade. Okay, let's move on, the, on and uh, let's move on and see what could be wrong with the first stop, where our clients still have the ability to use HTTP/2. Head of line blocking again. Uh, we've solved HTTP/1 head of line blocking, yeah. But what about TCP head of line blocking? As it turns out, HTTP2 only solved head of line blocking and the HTTP layer, which we could call head of line blocking at the application layer. But below this level, there are other levels, network level, TCP. However, TCP doesn't even know that it's transmitting HTTP. All the TCP knows is that it has been given a series of bytes that it must transfer from one computer to another. Let's see an example uh, what should happen if, for example, first packet, first TCP packet is lost, but second and third are received. TCP will hold back second and third packets, waiting for first to retransmit it. It always tries to retransmit first packet. However, we can see that at the HTTP2 level, the data from second stream in uh, HTTP2's perspective uh, is uh, present completely in, uh, and uh, HTTP can use it. But without a first packet retransmit, the, the TCP can send it to, uh, to a browser and then browser to up levels to parse it. The browser, but is stuck waiting for a first packet retransmit. In conclusion, uh, the, the fact that TCP doesn't know about HTTP2's independent streams means that TCP layer head of line blocking also ends up head of line blocking HTTP. This makes HTTP2 highly unreliable and worse performant in poor conditions. All this may seem like unnecessarily details until you realize that the internet is a fundamentally unreliable net <coughs> network. Packets can and do get lost and delayed during transport from one endpoint to another. We continue the topic of disadvantages, and uh, here is what else I thought was interesting for today's talk. So again, in HTTP2, we have one big TCP connection and a lot of streams in it. An HTTP2 message consists of many individual frames and these frames from multiple streams are interleaved, multiplexed. The other in which the frame are interleaved and delivered both by the client and server becomes a critical performance consideration. Unfortunately, 
it's also important to know that a single TCP connection has a limited bandwidth. The HTTP2 standard allows each stream to have an associated weight and dependency. The combination of stream dependencies and the weights allows to the client to construct a communicate a prioritization tree that expresses how it would prefer to receive responses. In turn, the server can use this information to prioritize streams processing by controlling the allocation of CPU, memory, bandwidth, and other resources to ensure optimal delivery of high priority responses to the client. Sounds simple and no, but in, it's actually complex in practice. Let's start with browser support for priorities. Each browser vendor has its own approach to stream prioritization. Chrome implements dynamic FCFS tree. Uh, it involves categorizing resources into five priority buckets and creating a linear dependency tree. Requests belonging to the same bucket are organized in a first-come, first-served manner, with all the requests in a lower priority buckets waiting for the most recent requests in a high priority buckets. Firefox is the only browser that builds a complex, multi-layered tree. It organizes the dependency tree in a predefined layout by opening a total of five perpetually idle streams. Safari take an unfair round robin. They generate wide, completely parallel dependency trees using only non-exclusive relationships. But in fact, which approach is <coughs> better and more efficient depends on the structure of the application. Unfortunately, the browser doesn't know how large resources is, uh, will be, what it's going to end up doing, what additional resources will be required. So only thing that browser can do is guess. Is that the browser construct what we call the heuristic. A guess what is going to be most important. It's not just the heuristics of the browsers that are different, it's also how they wish this to be enforced on the wire. Chrome really likes everything to be downloaded fully sequential order. Safari does a weighted round robin scheme, so HTML is more important and get more bandwidth than others. Firefox does a little bit more complex. It tries to give more priority to the more important resources, so the images are left a bit later. But this is all only one side of the coin. And the other is that the server can accept what the browser has suggested but it can also override it by ad applying its own prioritization logic. Sounds fantastic, is actually very, very complex in practice. In a real life, a good number of servers don't support prioritization, but for those that do, they all honor the client's requests. Per the specification, HTTP2 prioritization is a dependency tree that requires full knowledge of all of the in-flight requests to be able to prioritize resources against each other. That allows for incredibly complex strategies, but is difficult to implement well on either the browser and server side. And if we return to our traditional scheme with uh, downgrade, with an edge proxy, which receives a million requests from different browsers for many different applications, about the logic of which it doesn't know and because of the downgrade to HTTP 1, can send information to the backend. We easily get uncontrollable and very unfair situation for user experience in different browsers. Okay, again, not everything is, is as good as we expected but it could be uh, worse. What happens if someone attacker says, hey, everything that I am requesting has the highest priority, and edge proxy accept and start first to serve all such requests. Since the proxy is prioritizing the attacker's requests, it may not have no resources left to handle other requests. By overwhelming the edge proxy with a flood of requests, the attacker can cause a denial of service for legitimate users. 
To mitigate such risks, edge proxies typically implement various security measures, such as rate limiting, requests reprioritization, and behavioral analysis of user requests. These measures aim to ensure a more equitable distribution of resources and protect against abuse. Okay, let's move on. And uh, again, we have the traditional downgrade scheme. And this time, thanks to the researcher James Kittle, we found very interesting vulnerabilities when a front-end server speaks HTTP2 with clients, but rewrites requests into HTTP1 before forwarding them to the backend server. This gives the attacker an ability to prepend arbitrary content at the start of the next legitimate user's request. In Scheme, smuggled requests uh, highlighted in uh, red. There are many such attacks, but today I will show you only one example to understand the essence of attack. If you want to learn more, you can uh, follow the link below. This example exploits a vulnerability on Netflix, which is already patched. Thanks to HTTP2 data frame length field, the content length header is not required. However, the HTTP2 RFC states that this header is permitted, provided it's correct. Due to the incorrect content length, the backend stopped processing the request early, and the data in uh, red was treated as the start of another request. This enabled attacker to add an arbitrary prefix to the next request, regardless of who sent it. He crafted the red prefix to trigger a response and redirect the victim's request to the, its own server. By redirecting JavaScript includes, he could execute malicious JavaScript to compromise Netflix accounts and steal passwords. Another example uh, that becomes possible due to protocol downgrade, as we already know, HTTP2 header compression significantly save bandwidth and reduce latency. But in scheme with downgrade, it can lead the DDoS attack called HTTP2 tsunami. In uh, 2017, the HTTP2 tsunami method was released. This is the abuse of header compression, which is then decompressed and kill the target server behind this proxy. This is an amplification attack that has a rather serious amplification factor. And to protect against such vectors, it's better to use cloud-based DDoS protection services, which have a special distributed filtration network and use a complex algorithm for detection and filtration. Jonathan Looney and uh, Piotr Sikora found as many as uh, eight DDoS options over HTTP2 three years ago, published bulletins. Netflix says that all the attack vectors are variations of the same time, where a client triggers a response from a vulnerable server and then refuses it to, to read it. You can read more about each on the corresponding CVE. And finally, my favorite section, what we have learned from all this. Every always uh, have a fallback option. Don't turn off HTTP2, uh, HTTP1 support, uh, never. Every new version of protocol drive to solve some limitations of previous, but we can't migrate the whole internet in new version at once for a short time. So there are old ones with their drawbacks and new versions that also have limitation and drawbacks, and we need to adapt with them and live for a very long time. Another interesting uh, fact is my personal experience uh, of communicating with our customers. Most people just follow the trend, trend, only trend, uh, when they plan to migrate to HTTP2. It, uh, the answer that is uh, trendy and uh, wanted too. And on the other hand, from others, uh, that it uh, says that it improves uh, CEO and increases conver conversion rate uh, accordingly. Or even worse, 
we ordered the development of mobile application uh, from a third party vendor and then they have uh, such uh, requirements. My message is uh, before implementing new solutions, always waited the uh, all prof pros and cons and ask for advice from independent experts in the industry. Thank you. I am ready to answer your questions. <coughs> Thank you, Edgar. Thank you. Please raise your hand to ask a question. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Otherwise, the, the prize would go to the speaker, and it's not what we're trying to achieve. Yes. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, one question. You were talking about um, uh, about different proxies uh, uh, mm. between the client and the server. Uh, and I wanted to ask if uh, why uh, can we have a situation where uh, we split uh, the HTTP2 stream into HTTP1 streams before actually uh, entering our like target network of um, uh, whether it be a DDoS attack provider or our um, actual data center that uh, that we maintain as a company which. Uh, handles all these requests and has uh, the target servers. Uh, thank you. OK, thank you for the question. Uh, because now no vendors of uh, load balancers of uh, any uh, web application firewalls, we don't have a reverse proxy which can support initiation in uh, uh, HTTP2 to uh, upstream module. It's very complex to develop. And now it is impossible. Uh, it, uh, yes, it leads a uh, lot of problems. It can, uh, we will need to downgrade the connection uh, to support a lot of expertise to analyze of uh, each request and then proxy to the downstreams, but it's real life. We don't get anything. Also, guys, I need to remind you that we have a discussion zone right outside, uh, right outside the hall. And if uh, Edgar doesn't answer all your questions, then uh, we will bring him to the discussion zone. And then without the microphones, in any language you like, Armenian, Russian, English, Chinese, uh, you can ask the questions. Please. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Uh, that was nice. Uh, I would like to know, should we use uh, constructions above uh, HTTP2, such as gRPC, to fix its vulnerabilities? Does it work? Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, thank you. It's a very good and uh, popular uh, question. Uh, gRPC requires end-to-end -end HTTP2 in transport uh, because uh, we can't. Uh, solution is to add additional modules in a web server and support it. And I already know then we can uh, use a, of HA proxy, which in client side can use a uh, HTTP2 in TLS, it's required, uh, and then downgrade, uh, offload SSL, and pass to upstream without downgrade. Only HA proxy can support end-to-end -end transport uh, uh, between uh, client and backend. It, uh, you can use gRPC. Thank you. If we could give the microphone. Over here, thank you. Any more questions? <coughs> Please raise your hands. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm afraid I have to kind of repeat the question that has already been asked about uh, why these uh, uh, multitude of proxies uh, in between the client and the server uh, do not upgrade to HTTP2. Uh, I understand the difficulties, but uh, in your opinion, how realistic it is to expect it in some future because uh, you said that HTTP2 feels like something very trendy and I imagine that if some cloud provider and uh, DDoS protection provider would offer end-to-end uh, -end HTTP2 support, it would uh, greatly increase their uh, 
competitive value on the market. So I wonder if it's in the future for us. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I think that a lot of legacy black boxes uh, which I can't upgrade to support an HTTP2. And all these boxes in production uh, for uh, decades. Uh, we can, uh, can't in one moment shut down all boxes and uh, trash it and uh, put uh, new ones to support its uh, wall. And legacy with us, I don't know <laughs> why it po uh, when it's possible. Maybe a second speaker can answer <laughs> more. Uh, more completely this question because uh, it uh, they works with Nginx. This is beautiful. Yes, where where uh, you advertise a speaker from another company. I love the engineering community. <laughs> yes, please. Hi. Uh, so it's more of a you know, philosophical question. Ah. Uh, you know, there is like a clash, like a lot of followers in the community uh, arguing about uh, whether protocols are better be binary or text-based. Like uh, on one side we have like readability, on another side we have kind of less errors and more type checking. Uh, what's your take on that? Like, uh, do you think that we should all like switch to binary at some point, or do you think that in some cases uh, readability is like a lot more important? Uh, thank you. Uh, binary is the best option because uh, we can compress it, and it's have a less error uh, prone, uh, uh, nearly in comparison with uh, text-based protocols. When I uh, we need to read each uh, line, and then uh, we can uh, make a lot of uh, mistakes and errors on it. The future only binary, and now we have a lot of tools which uh, help us to troubleshoot our problems in binary. Uh, I don't see any problem with it. Any more questions? There's one. Hey, uh, one more philosophical question, uh, and it's more about the, the future of HTTP. How do you see the next version of HTTP and uh, do you think it's possible to combine uh, the best of two worlds, like uh, having HTTP to constrain the communication and uh, sockets to eliminate the latency? Future, thank you. F future of HTTP is uh, now uh, HTTP 3, which already is a uh, standard. Uh, it uh, uses uh, UDP in, uh, as a basis and all other uh, communication and uh, Checks perform a quick layer and security also. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. It's a it's a good question. To have to have proper future, you need a true plus one, and whoever's your yeah. plus one defines your future. So yeah, yeah. from HTTP plus two one. to HTTP three, yeah. yes. Uh, so who gets the prize for best question? Uh, best question, of gRPC second one. Nice. So, if you could please uh, wave to, to our helpers. Edgar, thank you for your talk. Thank you. So